The initial reports from the Accord scout ships labeled the planet as unremarkable, a terrestrial world with breathable atmosphere, extensive biosphere, and a technologically primitive native species designated humans. Standard procedure dictated observation, the establishment of the dominant species, then formal contact under the auspices of the Accord. That was before the humans crossed the Accord demarcation zone. Ships, absurdly primitive contraptions, barely spaceworthy, periodically crossed the border, ignoring all hails and warnings. The Accord viewed them as little more than pests. A few minor trade sanctions, the dispatch of a small punitive task force, would resolve the issue and teach the humans a valuable lesson. Don't trifle with the Accord. The task force, three frigates and their support vessels, entered the human system, positioned themselves over the planet's primary terrestrial colony world, and began their bombardment. The target was the colony's administrative industrial center. They expected a swift capitulation. The humans reduced to a cowering, submissive state ideal for absorbing into the Accord. But they were wrong. The humans had crude planetary defense systems. Ground-to-orbit kinetic weapons that barely bridged the upper reaches of the atmosphere posed minimal threats, easily neutralized by the frigate's defenses. What followed was meant to be a clinical display of power. Orbital bombardment would cripple their infrastructure, rendering any organized defiance impossible. The first day of bombardment went according to plan. Cities on the targeted continent burned. The humans, as expected, went into panic. Yet, beneath the initial shock, a thread of something unexpected snaked through the Accord tactical data streams. There was a hardening, not a collapse. On the second day, the bombardment continued, yet it yielded diminishing returns. Crude human aerospace fighters launched to intercept the bombing runs. Their results were minimal, but displayed a tactical awareness that the Accord found unanticipated. Brigade sensor arrays began detecting anomalies. Human systems were shutting down entire swaths of their power grid. Industrial output slowing, not stopping. The Accord analytics concluded that this was merely a last-ditch attempt at mitigating damage. It was far more than that. By the third day, the Accord commanders grew uneasy. The humans continued to defy expectations. The bombardment had achieved almost complete destruction of its intended targets, yet human communication networks flickered on, fragmented, but with a troubling focus on military channels. From the devastated wasteland emerged the human response. Not surrender or supplication, but threats mixed with defiant posts. The Accord intelligence officers mocked them as the futile howls of the condemned. Then, the first ground skirmishes began. The initial reports dismissed the human ground forces as disorganized rabble, their weapons laughable compared with standard Accord weaponry. While true, it missed a terrifying truth. Humans weren't fighting a standard war. Small squads, operating with what the Accord initially assumed was no central command, launched brutal short-range ambushes. The squads, on contact with the Accord patrols, would deploy explosives, often crudely repurposed mining equipment to inflict losses, then vanish into the rubble. The Accord command, used to fighting conventional wars of attrition, scoffed initially. These humans were simply prolonging their inevitable defeat. They deployed advanced sensor sweeps, assuming the ambushes could only work with pre-planned coordination. They would root out the human command centers and deliver a crushing blow. But there were no command centers. What they found had sent shivers down the spines of even seasoned Accord commanders. No encrypted data streams. No encoded radio waves, just single humans, often civilians the Accord had dismissed as irrelevant, wandering in the landscape, seemingly aimlessly. They were anything but. Each was a human sensor, noting Accord positions, patrol routes, equipment inventories. The information flowed not through machines that could be hacked and jammed, but through the most ancient human network, word of mouth, gestures, coded symbols left in the ruins. The Accord, with its vastly superior technology, was fighting a ghost. Worse, the ghost was learning, adapting. Crude imitations of Accord weapons began appearing in ambush sites. Captured Accord soldiers, when recovered, were often stripped of equipment, sometimes brutally mutilated, their body parts left as macabre calling cards. The Accord, priding itself on calculated, logical warfare, had found itself facing a species that reveled in the chaos of battle. 
that seemed to evolve with every engagement. The Accord forces sent to quell the humans weren't being defeated, they were being consumed. Panic began spreading through the Accord fleet ranks. Accord doctrine had no counter for this type of war. A conflict waged not on battlefields, but inside the minds of the enemy. Humans appeared suicidal, recklessly throwing themselves against superior forces, yet with every death, the survivors seemed to become more cunning, more vicious. A hunt began for the architect of this maddening campaign. An Accord intelligence asset, buried deep within the smoldering remains of a human communications hub, yielded a name. Elias Kane. Military records classified him as an unremarkable, mid-level officer, combat veteran of numerous minor border conflicts. He was deemed too old, too insignificant to be a serious threat. It proved a fatal underestimation. Elias Kane wasn't a brilliant strategist. He had no overarching plan, no masterful tactics. He was, however, something far more dangerous for the Accord. A survivor. Conflicts that should have ended his life simply seasoned him. Every battle lost made Cain more resourceful, more ruthless. He cared nothing for doctrine, honor, or even the grand schemes of human leaders. He was surviving, and he would make the Accord pay in blood for every meter of ground they took. Kane's campaign was less about winning, and more about making the Accord bleed. He understood the enemy prized order, technology, predictability. He became their nightmare. A flickering shadow haunted the ravaged colony. Accord convoys disappeared into ghost traps, their state-of-the-art equipment vanishing, and then reappearing in the hands of human partisans. Supply lines became gauntlets of improvised explosive devices. Patrols dissolved into the ruins only found days later their bodies transformed into grotesque warnings. The Accord responded as they always did, with overwhelming force. They erased forests, suspecting Cain used them as cover. They leveled villages, assuming they were harboring him. The humans simply melted deeper into the wilderness, the ruins. Their will to resist fueled not by patriotism or ideology, but a far more primal instinct, pure, unquenchable hatred. Cain hunted relentlessly, began to acquire an almost mythic status in the Accord's eyes. They labeled him unbreakable. In grudging acknowledgement that every attempt to eliminate him only seemed to make the humans more dangerous. They offered bounties, negotiated truces, even sent covert teams in desperate assassination attempts. Nothing worked. It seemed the very soil of the colony had turned against them. Morale within the Accord task force plummeted. The officers, used to tidy, predictable wars, were starting to crack under the strain. Soldiers rotated onto the surface returned with haunted looks, whispers of the humans and booby traps in children's toys, and shadows that moved with inhuman speed. The once neat, clinical operation was unraveling, devolving into brutality, met with even greater savagery. The stalemate dragged on. A war measured not in victories, but in mounting body counts, and a creeping madness, gnawing away at the Accord's resolve. It was into this cauldron of despair that High Command dispatched a solution, the Exterminatus Directive. If the colony could not be pacified, it would be erased. High-yield orbital bombardment would scour the troublesome world clean. The decision was as logical as it was ruthless. The Accord wasn't built on sentiment and the spiraling losses on this single, insignificant planet were becoming a stain on the Accord's prestige. From the orbiting frigates, the order went out. The bombardment would begin within 24 hours. All Accord personnel were to evacuate to the fleet immediately. News reached the surviving humans with astonishing speed. Their fragmented communication networks crackled to life. There were no grand speeches of defiance, no last-ditch calls to arms. Just the chillingly simple message, intercepted and hastily translated by Accord cryptographers. We are coming. The Accord dismissed it as an empty boast, a final act of desperation. They had no way of knowing how close to the truth they truly were. The humans didn't have the capacity to attack the frigates in orbit. What they did have was Cain, and he in turn had a plan born from a lifetime of fighting against impossible odds. The bombardment had focused on the colony's primary continent, leaving its remote, 
mountainous regions relatively untouched. It was here that Cain and a hand-picked squad had vanished months prior. The Accord analysts assumed they had died, or at least posed no real threat. It was another fatal miscalculation. Cain wasn't hiding, he was building, drawing on his deep, brutal understanding of the human capacity for warfare. Using captured Accord mining equipment, he had carved a vast tunnel network through the mountains, culminating directly beneath the primary Accord ground base. The exterminatus bombardment began precisely on schedule. The frigates in high orbit unleashed a devastating torrent of energy, systematically turning the targeted continent into a molten wasteland. Accord commanders watched the devastation with grim satisfaction. They had, they believed, finally broken the humans. Blinded by their arrogance, they were too ignorant to notice the ground beneath their primary base subtly shift and crack. They didn't see the stolen Accord explosives planted over long months detonate in a cataclysmic chain reaction. The base imploded, swallowed by the earth, sending a shockwave rippling through the surrounding area. From the ruins erupted the true human response. Not an army, but a ragged, screaming horde, composed of those the Accord had deemed too weak to fight. Too old, too young, too wounded. They armed themselves with anything at their disposal. Rocks, sharpened debris, their bare hands. The Accord, expecting to mop up the few demoralized survivors, found themselves facing a wave of suicidal fury. The hours that followed defied description. Human and Accord soldiers became indistinguishable in a maelstrom of close quarters combat. All pretense of tactics and order dissolved into a desperate fight for survival. The carefully programmed battle protocols of the Accord, meant to optimize warfare, proved useless against the enemy, driven by a raw, unpredictable primal will to keep fighting until their dying breath. The humans, seemingly driven to a collective madness by the imminent destruction of their world, did not retreat and did not surrender. By late afternoon, the humans had recaptured the shattered remnants of their base. Elias Kane, bloodied but alive, staggered from the wreckage. In one hand, he clutched a cracked, primitive data pad. In the other, he held an Accord signal beacon. He keyed the beacon, transmitting a single defiant message on an open channel for the Accord fleet to hear. You want a lesson, Accord? Here it is. Humans don't break, we bend, we twist, but most importantly, we endure. And right now, we're coming for you. The bombardment ended abruptly, the Accord fleet facing the unimaginable. A species that refused to die, retreated into the void, leaving behind a scarred planet and the echo of those terrifying words, humans don't break. News of the colony's defiance spread through the remaining human worlds with the speed of wildfire. It wasn't a tale of a triumphant victory, but one of brutal survival, of primal refusal to be extinguished. The image of Elias Kane, the unbreakable, emerged as a symbol both terrifying and inspiring. Humans, too long seen as fractured and disorganized by themselves and their galactic neighbors, began to rediscover a dormant strength. The Accord, stung by the debacle, sent a larger, heavily armed fleet to finally crush the human rebellion. The humans, hardened and armored with salvaged Accord weapons, were ready for a conventional war. They were wrong this time. The Accord did not come to conquer. They came to negotiate. The following peace talks were tense and protracted. The Accord, their pride shaken, offered reparations, trade concessions, even limited representation within the Accord itself. The terms were surprisingly generous, or not from altruism, but cold calculation. The humans had demonstrated a capability for savagery that terrified the orderly Accord. It was better they decided to have the humans within the system where they could be monitored, co-opted, and contained. The humans, represented by survivors of the colony and Elias Kane himself, now a grim, skeletal figure, barely recognizable as a human, were unmoved. They had no interest in the Accord's grand schemes. Their demands were brutal in their simplicity. Recognition of human sovereign territory, no Accord interference, and most importantly, to be left alone. The Accord, after much internal debate and dissent, 
finally agreed. The human delegates then did something the Accord found utterly baffling. They walked away. They made no pronouncements of future cooperation, no grand schemes of peace. Elias Kane, asked about the future of humanity, replied with a weary shrug, his voice rasp. We survive. We rebuild. We remember. Then he vanished back into the ruins of his world. The Accord kept its word, mostly. Human worlds became no-go zones, skirted around by Accord trade routes. Stories abounded of humans watching them in the shadows, of strange activity on supposedly barren planets. A chilling unease lingered within the Accord. They had achieved a victory of sorts, but one that felt oddly hollow. They had encountered a species that had looked into the abyss, and instead of finding despair, they found the ultimate tool for survival, pure, unyielding defiance. They had learned a lesson, one they would try very hard not to forget. Humans don't break. Centuries passed, humanity expanded, and their territories are ragged, loosely defined region bordering Accord space. The Accord, now more cautious, monitored their untidy neighbors. Humans did indeed rebuild their colonies sprawling across once abandoned planets with ferocious speed. Their technology, incorporating elements of scavenged accord designs, was unpredictable, often crudely cobbled together, yet disturbingly effective. The accord analysts concluded that humans had become frighteningly adaptable, the conflict that forged them accelerating their evolutionary progress at an alarming rate. Trade relations between humans and the wider accord were limited, strained by mistrust. However, a grudging respect began to emerge. Mercenary companies composed of entirely human veterans sprang up, gaining a reputation as brutally efficient. Often tasked with missions other species would find morally reprehensible. Stories circulated throughout Accord territories of humans, appearing seemingly from nowhere, of their capacity for endurance in harsh environments surpassing that of any known species. They became more legends than reality. Ghost stories whispered between jump drives on long space voyages. The name Elias Kane faded from common memory, relegated to obscure historical archives, yet, even as the Accord grew older, richer, and more secure, a vague dread persisted in the collective consciousness, a sense they had unleashed something onto the galactic stage, something they did not fully comprehend, and perhaps could never truly control. Then came the Reavers. They emerged from the uncharted depths, a biomechanical scourge unlike anything the Accord had faced. The Accord, with its reliance on technology and vast interconnected networks, was horrifically vulnerable. Worlds fell in chillingly short order, the Reavers devouring entire planets, replicating and growing at a staggering rate. Accord fleets, designed for conventional combat, were overwhelmed by the sheer numbers and relentless efficiency of the Reaver advance. Despair gripped the Accord as they finally accepted their meticulously built empire was crumbling. Calls for aid went unanswered. Their neighbors, old rivals, and uneasy allies retreated behind their own borders, unwilling to risk annihilation against the relentless reaver tide. Yet, one transmission cut through the fear-filled static. It was a single word, broadcast on an ancient frequency the Accord had long abandoned. Unbreakable. From human space emerged a fleet unlike anything the Accord had witnessed. The ships were an odd mix of salvaged Accord tech, held together by visible welds and exposed wiring. Their design seemed haphazard, lacking the elegance of Accord engineering. They were, however, undeniably built for war. Leading this ragtag armada was the familiar, monstrous silhouette, a dreadnought, cobbled together from the scavenged hulls of countless Accord warships, yet... Its bridge held a figure that sent a jolt of disbelieving horror through the surviving Accord Admirals. Elias Kane. Not a man anymore, but something other. Scars crisscrossed visible flesh. Prosthetic limbs replaced those lost in a long-ago conflict. His eyes, barely human, burned with a cold, merciless light. The ensuing battle was less a clash of fleets and more an act of primal, cathartic fury. The humans, driven by centuries of lurking resentment and their own deep-seated need for survival, slammed into the reavers with suicidal abandon, 
that horrified the tactically minded accord. Logic dictated a retreat, regrouping. The humans ignored logic. They fought not for victory, but to inflict as much pain as possible before the inevitable end. And something miraculous happened. It began as an anomaly, a slight deviation in reaver attack patterns. Then, a disruption in communication channels. The Accord analysts, initially assuming it was a fluke, watched in mounting disbelief. The human ships, despite their technological infurity, were not being exterminated. They were holding. Then, the impossible. The Reaver advance stalled, faltered. Their seemingly unstoppable tide began to receive. The Accord, unable to fully comprehend what they were witnessing, received transmissions from the human fleet. Words once dismissed as barbaric boasts now echoed with horrifying truth. Adapt. Improvise. Survive. Elias Kane, broadcasting, in the clear for all the Accord to hear, had not come to save them. He had come, as promised centuries ago, to teach them a lesson. Humans hadn't learned to fight wars. They had learned to fight extinction. They evolved not on the battlefield, but in the ashes of defeat. And in this crucible, they had discovered an awful truth. The Reavers, for all their horrifying efficiency, were predictable. Their biomechanical nature, once a strength, was now a crippling weakness. The humans had spent centuries not planning for victory, but for the ultimate fight for survival. They sabotaged the Reaver communication networks not to disable them, but to feed false information. They deployed not fleets, but distractions, luring Reaver forces into ambushes, into kill zones. The Accord watched in horrifying fascination as humanity, the chaotic, illogical species they once dismissed, systematically dissected the Reaver threat, turning its own strengths against it. The conflict dragged on, but the tide had irrevocably turned. In the crucible of annihilation, forged by a species that refused to be extinguished, the Accord found not salvation, but a horrifying lesson in what happens when a sleeping giant finally awakens. The Reaver War raged for decades, a meat grinder of galactic proportions. Humans and the Accord fought not as allies, but as two desperate species clinging to survival against the common enemy. In this crucible of unyielding conflict, a begrudgingly horrific kinship formed. Accord forces learned to discard their rigid doctrines, embracing the brutal chaos that had become humanity's weapon. Humans, in turn, begrudgingly accepted that sometimes cold logic had its place in the desperate struggle for survival. Elias Kane remained an enigma. His transmissions were as cryptic as ever, his orders seemingly suicidal yet uncannily effective. Stories emerged of his monstrous presence on battlefields, directing not through command centers, but through a frightening psychic connection to every human fighter, whispered tactics born of an unending bloodshed in their minds. The war's turning point came not on some grand battlefield, but within the twisted hive mind of the Reavers themselves. Humans, their capacity for adaption, accelerated by centuries of relentless warfare, did the unthinkable. They hacked into the Reavers. Crude, cyber warfare probes infected the code, mirroring the rapid evolution of the human mind itself. This code infiltrated the Reavers' biomechanical networks. Chaos rippled through the Reaver hive mind, disrupting their relentless advance, sending them into a frenzy of infighting and uncoordinated attacks. The final battle took place in the depths of uncharted space, this location being the source of the Reaver scourge. It was less a battle, and more so a species-wide suicide charge. The Human Accord Alliance, knowing this could be their last stand, threw everything they had against fighting the Reaver homeworld. Planetary bombardment turned the sky into a searing inferno. Fighters swarmed, sacrificing themselves as distractions for boarding parties. Elias Kane himself led the final charge, a biomechanically augmented monstrosity at the head of the screaming horde of human and accord shock troops. The losses on both sides were catastrophic, but in the end, the Reaver Queen, the twisted biological core of the species, was destroyed. The war stuttered to a halt, the surviving Reavers dissolving into disorganization. Left leaderless, the remnants of them were mercilessly hunted down. The Human Accord Alliance had won, but they had not triumphed. Their civilizations were in ruins, their populations decimated. 
The war had not brought them together. It had merely made them more alike, scarred, ruthless, and utterly devoid of any illusions of galactic peace. As the survivors staggered back to their respective territories, there was no talk of unity, of a new galactic order, only a wary truce born of exhaustion, and the shared knowledge that out in the vast, uncaring darkness of space, there could be something even worse waiting. The universe has an ironic sense of humor. In the centuries after the Reaver War, it wasn't an external threat that brought the humans and the Accord together, but simple, undeniable greed. The shattered remains of Reaver technology held the promise of advancements that could propel either species into dominance. Both sides weakened, but hardened by the long war, eyed the abandoned battlefields with not sorrow, but avarice. Border skirmishes between humans and Accord forces erupted, escalating into full-blown conflicts. The old hatreds, briefly subdued by the existential terror of the Reavers, reignited. But, this time, the wars were different. Both sides now fought with a terrifying ruthlessness, forged in the apocalyptic struggle for survival. Bioweapons ripped from the Reavers were unleashed. Planets were sacrificed for strategic advantage, and the line between soldier and civilian ceased to exist. Elias Kane was nowhere to be found. Some said he had finally died on the Reaver homeworld. Others claimed he lurked in the shadows, his endless war taking a new, even more terrifying form. Yet, his legacy lived on. Humans no longer saw war as a matter of battles and campaigns, but of attrition and endless adaptation. The Accord, their once unshakable faith in technology and procedure broken, embraced the primal brutality that they had long tried to repress. The galaxy slipped into a new dark age. Not the roaring inferno of the Reaver War, but a cold, vicious struggle between the two species locked in a cycle of revenge. In this bleak future, the grand ideals that defined both humans and the Accord withered away. There were no heroes left, only survivors. No lofty goals, only determination to endure one day longer than the enemy. And as the galaxy burned, a chilling realization set in. The true lessons of the Reaver War was yet to be learned. Humans and the Accord had faced the ultimate threat, and in doing so, had become the threat themselves. They had stared into the Abyss, and the Abyss had stared back, reshaping them into their own monstrous image. Perhaps, in the end, the only way to break the unbreakable is to make them break themselves. In the unending bleakness lied scattered flickers of a different path. They were far and few between, drowned out by the constant drumbeat of war, but they existed. On an Accord world, devastated in a recent conflict, a medic stumbles upon a hidden cache of medical supplies. Human supplies. Attached is a crudely scrawled note, barely legible in Accord standard. For the wounded, no matter what the side, the act is dismissed by Accord command as meaningless propaganda. But the seed of doubt is there. Could the enemy they paint as monstrous be capable of such an act? On a barren human colony, a lone Accord scout ship crash lands. The pilot, expecting death or torture, encounters not brutality, but grudging assistance. Wounded and treated by grim-faced human medics, he is blindfolded and sent back to his lines. A pact is broken, a life for a life. The human commander is punished, but his soldiers, exhausted by the endless war, begin to question the futility of it all. Stories circulate, whispers amongst the scarred veterans on both sides, of moments of hesitation before firing, of the enemy, facing not as a target, but as a reflection of their own brutality. These moments are brutally suppressed, dismissed by both sides as weakness. But the questions linger. How long can a species fight itself before it is consumed by its own force? Can there be a future forged not in victory, but in that simple act of refusing to fight another day? Elias Kane, if he still exists, casts a long shadow. Yet, his spirit of relentless defiance had taken an insidious turn. Both humans and the Accord now fight with the grim realization that they have become the unstoppable force they once feared. 
exhaustion seeps in. Wars rage on, but with less fever, more from ingrained habit than any real belief in victory. In the depths of space, new players stir. Species that had watched the endless human accord conflict with a mix of curiosity and disinterest. They see two once promising races locked in self destruction. They see ripe territories, weakened defenses, resources to be taken. Perhaps then the galaxy will be the ultimate victor. Perhaps from the ashes of the two unbreakable species, something new will finally arrive. Whether that something will learn from the mistakes of its predecessors, or simply repeat them on a vaster scale remains to be seen. In a universe governed by hunger and ambition, the cycle of conflict may be the only truly unbreakable force. Millennia pass. The once great civilizations of humanity and the Accord fade into crumbling ruins and half-forgotten legends. New species rise to dominate the interstellar stage, their histories recording tales of a destructive, self-obsessed race called humans, and their enigmatic antagonists, the Accord. These tales are cautionary, dismissed as the inevitable doom of those who prioritize conflict over cooperation. Yet, in a distant quarter of the galaxy, an anomaly persists. It's a region of space, once the epicenter of the ceaseless wars, now strangely devoid of intelligent life. Even the most ambitious expansionists avoid it sensing something wrong within its boundaries. Archaeolic expeditions, driven by the insatiable curiosity, eventually brave the desolate expanse. What they find is not a cosmic graveyard, but an enigma. Dead worlds, yes, but not barren ones. Life has returned, but warped, twisted into forms both horrifyingly alien and strangely familiar. Towering constructs, composed of fused metal and organic tissue, pulsate with an unsettling energy. Vast, tangled biospheres choke the ruins of cities, where creatures stalk that seem stitched together from fragments of countless species, human, accord, and others unrecognizable. The intrepid explorers uncover data caches, surviving the relentless attacks of the twisted inhabitants. They decipher fragmented chronicles, not of extinction, but of chilling evolution. In their final centuries, humans and the Accord had crossed a horrifying threshold. Their endless search for new ways to annihilate one another had taken them beyond weapons and into the realm of manipulation itself. The final act of both civilizations wasn't mutual destruction, but a grotesque fusion. In a final desperate bid for the ultimate advantage, they turned their destructive urges inward. Humans, abandoning their prized adaptability, sought to weaponize their genetic code to become the bio-horrors they once fought. The Accord, terrified and equally desperate, sought to fuse with their technology, ascending beyond the weakness of flesh. The results were catastrophic and hauntingly poetic. In their determination to destroy one another, they succeeded merely in creating something new, an abomination born of their combined flaws. The explorers, Realizing the nightmarish truth, name this region the Crucible. It becomes a grim testament, a whispered warning against the hubris of species that seek not coexistence, but endless conflict. The tale of the humans in the Accord, the unbreakable who ultimately broke, is archived, analyzed, and serves as a chilling case study in universities across the galaxy. Yet even in the most advanced civilizations, an uncomfortable question persists. Is true conflict ever fully extinguished? Do the embers of self-destruction lie dormant in every species, waiting for the spark of greed, fear, or simple insatiable ambition to ignite them once more? The answer, the universe seems to suggest with grim silence, lies in the future, yet to be unraveled. The Crucible, once a scar on the galaxy, becomes an unlikely place of pilgrimage. Delegations from a myriad of species, unified in their horror, descend into this twisted monument of self-destruction. They don't come to loot or seek lost technology, but to simply bear witness, to understand the depth to which two advanced civilizations fell, and in doing so, inoculate themselves against a similar fate. Among these delegations, a pattern emerges. 
Those species on the brink of interspecies conflict, their tensions rising, are the most frequent visitors to the crucible. The twisted remains of humans and accord that now roam the ruined worlds become a macabre deterrent. This is your future, a crucible silently screams. This is the end of the path you walk. Turn back while you still can. The effect is profound. Wars that seemed inevitable are averted. Peace treaties, once dismissed as naive, are hammered out in the looming shadow of the Crucible's legacy. A peculiar ritual develops. Leaders of rival factions are taken into the very heart of the Crucible. They are forced to confront the mutilated horrors, the fragmented recordings of the last desperate battles, and witness firsthand what awaits if they succumb to the endless cycle of vengeance. Few emerge unchanged. The Crucible serves another unintended purpose. It becomes a testing ground for those committed to ensuring such an apocalypse never happens again. Biologists, technologists, social engineers, and philosophers descend. Not to study the grotesque inhabitants, but the conditions that led to their creation. They seek patterns in the decline, warning signs that the galaxy has learned to recognize. A new alliance is formed, not for trade or conquest, but for perpetual vigilance. Its headquarters established in orbit around the Crucible. They name themselves the Watchers. They are an eclectic mix of species, scholars, and warriors, all united in their unshakable belief that understanding how the civilizations destroy themselves is the key from preventing it from happening again. The work of the Watchers is never-ending. The pull of pride, the lure of dominance, the whisper that this time it might be different. They are eternal threats to the galactic peace. But now, there is a counterweight. The Crucible serves as both grim memento and a laboratory for preventing future apocalypse. Each analysis, each averted conflict, each treaty negotiated in its shadow is a testament to the chilling truth. Sometimes, the ultimate survival of a species lies not in the strength to fight, but in a wisdom to walk away. The galaxy, a tapestry of ambition, wonder, and enduring flaws, still dances on the precipice of destruction. But thanks to the legacy of the Unbreakable and their Crucible, it does so with a new awareness. The echo of Elias Kane's defiant cry still rings across the stars, but now it carries a mournful question. Will you endure by learning the hardest lesson of all? Will you break the cycle? In the endless passage of cosmic time, even the most enduring structures begin to fade. The Watchers, through their relentless study, discover a disturbing truth. The Crucible itself is unstable. The unchecked bioengineering, the twisting of technological and genetic boundaries, has left the region warping reality itself. Pockets of unstable space begin appearing. Planets vanish, shallowed into shimmering voids. The creatures of the Crucible evolve at a horrifying pace, each generation more grotesque, and more capable of warping the very fabric of the region. The Watchers, committed to their cause, initially see it as yet another challenge, a puzzle to be solved in their grand quest to protect the galaxy from itself. Then, the transmissions began. They are fragments at first, garbled voices, glimpses of horrific visions bleeding through from somewhere within the Crucible's heart. As the Watchers refine their containment and monitoring technology, the transmissions intensify. They are filled with rage, with unending pain, and an insidious beckoning. The source of the transmission becomes a grim obsession for the Watchers. They organize expeditions into the most unstable areas. Encountering resistance unlike anything faced before, the creatures of the Crucible, as if guided by some malevolent intelligence, attack with a horrifying coordination. Teams vanish into the swirling anomalies, some returning broken and maddened babbling of impossible landscapes and unrelenting torment. Truth, when it is finally revealed, is more terrifying than any could have imagined. In their final spiral towards self-destruction, the humans and the Accord had stumbled upon something far greater and more terrible than themselves. Deep beneath the ruins, in one of the dead worlds, the Watchers discovered a vast, pulsating structure. It is not mechanical, not biological, but something else ancient, malevolent, and boundlessly powerful.
Transmission are its psychic whispers. In its hunger, it had sensed the conflict, the rage, and the despair of the dying civilization. In reaching out, humans and Accord had unwillingly bound this entity to the region. With each passing generation, the entity grows stronger, fueling the instability of the Crucible, gradually seeping reality into itself. The Watchers face an impossible choice. They cannot abandon the Crucible, for if the entity breaks free, the consequences for the galaxy are unthinkable. Yet, remaining means battling not only the warped monstrosities, but an enemy that can corrupt their very minds. A radical faction emerges within the Watchers. They argue that containment is futile, that the only way to save the galaxy is to wipe the Crucible from existence, deploy a weapon of unimaginable power, and cauterize the wound before it consumes everything. It is a plan born of desperation, echoing the same relentlessness that ultimately doomed both humanity and the Accord. The debate rages within the Watcher's Council. Is it an echo of the countless galactic debates they had sought to prevent? Do you risk everything on a single destructive act, hoping to eliminate the threat? Or do you endure, contain, and desperately seek another solution, knowing failure could be catastrophic? And somewhere deep within the Crucible, the entity stirs, feeding on the Watcher's conflict, its whispers growing louder with each day. The legacy of the Unbreakable has come full circle. The ultimate question they faced, amplified on a cosmic scale, is now poised before their inheritors. In saving the galaxy, are the Watchers destined to become the very monster they fight? The debate amongst the Watchers spirals into open conflict. The faction advocating annihilation gains strength. They argue that the entity possesses an existential threat to all life as they know it. Every day of indecision is a day closer to a galaxy bathed in the entity's maddening light. They label the opposition faction, those advocating containment and a desperate search for other options, as weak dreamers, shackled by an obsolete morality. A grim irony settles over the Watchers. They who sought to protect the galaxy from the seeds of self-destruction now find those seeds sprouting within their own ranks. The crisis reaches its tipping point when a rogue element of the Annihilation Faction launches a preemptive strike, they do not possess the planet-killing weaponry they desire, but their target is the heart of the Watchers themselves, their orbital headquarters. Caught off guard, the Watchers suffer devastating losses, yet, in the chaos, those favoring the containment strike back, disabling the strike force and revealing the split within their ranks. The galaxy now observes the unfolding conflict within the Watchers with a mix of dread and grim fascination. Here, embodied in microcosm, is the very struggle they sought to help others overcome. The fractured Watchers fight a shadow war within the Crucible. The entity, sensing opportunity, pours its corrupting energy not into the physical landscape, but into the minds of both factions. Old hatreds reignite. Petty rivalries escalate, and paranoia consumes all rational thought. Both sides become obsessed with the destruction of the other, convinced only their path can save the galaxy. The creatures of the Crucible suffer a grotesque transformation. Now not merely monstrous, they become twisted reflections of the internal conflict within the Watchers. Some become terrifyingly precise, wielding salvage technology mirroring the Annihilation Faction's cold focus. Others become swarming hordes, overwhelming their foes through mindless brutality that mirrors the rage of the Containment Faction. Then comes an event that shifts the balance. An intercepted transmission. It's a solitary cry for help, garbled, but unmistakably coming deep within the entity's domain. The transmission reveals the existence of a resistance, remnants of human and accord consciousness that somehow endured the fall of their civilization. Their minds, fused by the crucible, exist as a fragile collective hidden within the heart of the entity. For the first time in millennia, there is a spark of hope. However, warped and broken, these survivors embody the resistance that led both humans and the Accord down their dark path. But crucially, they also represent the potential for something different. They have resisted the Entity's corrupting influence, and now, they offer an alliance against the common foe. The factions within the Watchers fall silent. The transmission cuts through their rage, an echo of their own original purpose. For all their differences, both sides realize the folly of their path. 
the true lesson of the crucible is laid bare before them. Even when facing cosmic horror, the greatest danger comes from within. The Watchers reunify, their internal conflict tempered by the realization that, to defeat the entity, they must overcome their own self-destructive impulses. Aided by the resistance, they formulate a desperate plan. They will tap into the entity's power, not to fight it, but to reshape it, to transform the crucible of destruction into one of rebirth. The galaxy watches the impossible unfold. Enemies stand side by side, focusing their technology and will. The entity thrashes, reality itself screaming in protest at this defiance. Yet, guided by the collective consciousness of human and Accord survivors, a sliver of the entity's power is severed and channeled. The Watchers aren't destroying the entity, but changing its very nature. The Crucible begins to shift, stabilizing the horrific anomalies. The nightmarish creatures cease their relentless attacks. They morph, regressing back into simpler forms. A wave of regenerative energy, twisted yet potent, washes across the dead worlds. New life springs forth, bizarre, resilient, a testament to the galaxy's ability to heal even the deepest of wounds. The entity deprived of its source of corruption and conflict diminishes. It doesn't die, but recedes into a sullen slumber. The Watchers stay, their mission forever altered. They become gardeners in this grotesque yet fertile ground. They study the entity, ensuring it never fully awakens. They nurture the new life, seeking the impossible. Beauty from ashes. Peace from the womb of war. The Crucible no longer stands as a monument to annihilation, but a testament to the enduring struggle for balance. The galaxy sends explorers. Scientists, not exploiters, but wide-eyed observers. Students of the cosmic lesson the Crucible now represents. On its reshaped world, a memorial rises. Two figures, human and accord. Forever locked in combat, yet subtly supporting one another. It is a symbol of the tenuous line between destruction and creation, and the endless vigilance required to choose the latter. A lesson bought with the blood of a species. In their end, perhaps the Unbreakable saved the galaxy after all, but only time could tell if their lesson will truly be learned. Eons pass. The Crucible recedes into galactic memory. No longer a place of stark terror, but a site of profound contemplation. The once fractured Watchers became a respected order. Their knowledge of conflict resolution and early warning signs of self-destruction sought out by civilizations across the cosmos. Students of history flock to the Crucible, carefully studying not its battlefields, but their absence. Peace, while never fully assured, becomes less of an anomaly and more of a state to strive for. Yet beneath the surface of galactic progress, shadows linger. The entity within the Crucible sleeps, but it does not die. Its whispers persist. Now insidious and seductive, rather than rage-filled and commanding. They coil around the dreams of those with unquenchable ambition. Those who whisper, this time it could be different. This time we could control it. The most dangerous of these ambitious souls is not some power-hungry warlord, but a brilliant, enigmatic scientist named Alara Voss. Once a revered member of the Watchers, she fell prey to the entity's subtle corruption. It offered her not domination, but the answer to a fundamental quandary that has plagued the galaxy since the Crucible revealed its secrets. Can true peace ever be achieved when there are beings of boundless potential, and therefore boundless hunger, lurking in the darkness? Voss begins her work in secret, establishing a research facility under the guise of continued study of the dormant entity. Her true goal is chillingly audacious. She seeks to harness the entity's power, not to reshape reality, but to reshape minds. Using a mix of salvaged crucible bioengineering and her own unsettling genius, she aims to create a psychic suppressor, a way to mute the whispers of ambition, aggression, and self-destructive impulses that lurk within every sentient being. Her experiments are monstrous. Unwilling test subjects drawn from the fringes of society are twisted in both body and mind under her relentless pursuit of her solution. Yet, for every failure, Voss grows more determined. She is convinced that a forced peace, 
However brutal the methods, is the only way to survive the galaxy from another crucible, from itself. News of Voss's research leaks, igniting a galactic firestorm. The Watchers are horrified, recognizing the echoes of their own darkest hour. Voss, in her pursuit, becomes an avatar of the Unbreakable's legacy, to its chillingly logical conclusion. Survival at any cost, even the cost of what makes them sentient. The galaxy teeters on the brink of a new conflict, mirroring the one that nearly destroyed it millennia ago. But this time, the stakes are even higher. If Voss succeeds, what is there to stop anyone from using the psychic suppressors as tools of domination? If she fails, will her reckless experimentation reawaken the entity, plunging the galaxy back into an age of madness? The Watchers must act, not as enforcers, but as protectors of the most dangerous thing in the galaxy, free will. Their battleground is not a planet, but the minds and hearts of the galactic citizenry. They must convince a fractured, fearful galaxy that true resilience lies not in enforced peace, but the unending, arduous, imperfect struggle towards it. They must remind the galaxy that just like the unbreakable humans, and accord, Civilizations have the potential for both monstrous darkness and breathtaking growth. Far away in the shadows of the Crucible, Alara Voss continues her work, driven by a chilling certainty. The entity whispered to her with a fundamental truth. The only way to break the cycle of conflict is to remove the galaxy's capacity for it entirely. Whether her actions will save or damn the galaxy forever remains a terrifying question echoing in the uncertain future. The battle against Alara Voss isn't fought with fleets and armies, but with ideas and relentless kindling of hope. The Watchers wage a quiet, desperate campaign. With each world they visit, they don't denounce Voss as a monster, but as a tragic reflection of the galaxy's deepest fears. They tell not just the story of the Crucible, but the quieter story of how it was transformed. They speak of choice, of struggle of the grim beauty that can arise from overcoming even the darkest impulses. Their message resonates most with those on the fringes of society, those who Voss seeks to exploit with promises of a life free from pain and conflict. The Watchers show these disaffected souls that it is not weakness to feel fear, anger, or despair. It is strength. The true struggle is not against these emotions, but in choosing the harder path of understanding them, learning from them, and growing from them. But doubt persists. Worlds sympathetic to the Watchers fear that this path is too slow, too fragile. The threat Voss poses, should she succeed, is absolute. A new faction emerges with the Watchers itself, the Realists. They argue for direct, decisive action. They demand that Voss be hunted down, her research destroyed, regardless of the cost. With a heavy heart, the Watchers realize that once more, they face the same question that tore them apart before. When facing existential danger, where is the line between necessary action and becoming the very thing you fight? As the galactic debate rages, Voss makes a breakthrough. Her psychic suppressor prototype is successful. Her test subjects are transformed into docile, blank-eyed shells, their minds seemingly scrubbed of all ambition, aggression, even the echoes of self-preservation. Horrified, yet emboldened, Voss escalates her plan. It is no longer about saving the future of the galaxy. It's about righting the wrongs of the past. She leads an audacious raid on the Crucible itself. Her followers, a mix of fanatics and opportunists, seize control of the barely inhabited region. She intends to tap into the entity's power source. Not to control it, but to amplify the effects of her suppressors on a galactic scale. It's annihilation. Not of species but the flawed essence that she believes breeds endless conflict. The galaxy reacts with a confused mix of dread and a desperate, twisted hope. Could this twisted plan be the answer? Could an enforced peace truly be attainable? The Watchers, fighting a two-fronted war against both Voss and the Realists advocating for preemptive no-holds, barred strike, stand firm. They remind the galaxy that the Unbreakable did not fight for mere survival, but for the right to fight to evolve, to make their own terrible, glorious mistakes. The ultimate confrontation, like the formation of the Crucible itself, is messy, chaotic, and driven by fear as much as it is by ideals. 
The Watchers, allied with a loose coalition of those wary of Voss's horrifying solution, confront her forces amidst the warp ruins of the Crucible. The battle isn't for territory, but for the hearts and minds of her followers. The conflict reaches its climax not on battlefield, but inside Voss's makeshift command center. A team of Watchers, specialists in empathy, history, and the darkest corners of psychology slip past the defenses. They confront Voss, not with weapons, but with a question. What comes after your victory? Voss, fueled by grim determination, initially scoffs. She paints a picture of a galaxy at peace, free from the endless cycle of suffering. But the Watchers press, without conflict, without ambition. What becomes of art, innovation, even the simple joy of striving for something better? Where does compassion come from? If there is no pain to understand, without darkness, how will the galaxy see the light? And in that moment, a flicker of doubt entered Voss's haunted eyes. The entity, long a seductive whisper, is now a silent, hungry void. And it only ever offered power, never answers. The Watchers offer her something far more terrifying, responsibility. If she destroys the capacity for conflict, she must also take on the burden of choosing what the galaxy becomes. The crucible itself seemed to hold its breath. Voss's followers, exposed to the frantic broadcasts of the galactic debate, hesitate. A mutiny erupts not out of violence, but a simple question echoing within their suppressed minds. Is this who I am? Alara Voss breaks, not in a dramatic collapse, but with a quiet surrender. The weight of not just saving a galaxy, but shaping it into something she alone envisions, crushes her spirit. The psychic suppressors are deactivated, their potential forever a chilling reminder of the precipice the galaxy had walked along. Voss chooses exile with the reformed crucible. She dedicates the rest of her life not to creating a perfect galaxy, but to helping new watchers understand the allure and terrible danger of easy solutions. The galaxy does not forget her name, but remembers her as a cautionary tale, a dark mirror to their own deepest flaws and enduring strength. This is the final lesson of the unbreakable, that a battle against darkness, both external and within ourselves, never truly ends. The crucible stands as a perpetual reminder that peace is not a destination, but a constant arduous journey paved with hard choices, setbacks, and the enduring belief that a galaxy scarred by its past can each day choose to heal and strive towards a brighter, even if uncertain, future.